Uh, so, so Peter. Yes. I I have something I must confess to you. What What are you going to confess? Uh, I uh, it's really difficult for me to say actually. Spit it out, man. Um, I've um, uh, I've cheated cheated on you. What? I went on a podcast called Left Thinking with this YouTube with this guy from this YouTube channel called Sansi. Oh, okay. Um, and you know we 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 talked about you know leftist politics, you know, like you and I used to do. Um, and you know it's gonna go up on his channel. Is he better at talking left than I am? No, no, no. That's not the point. You know, it's just, you weren't there. And he was there, and, and you know he wanted me. You know he just he asked me, and I shouldn't have done it. And I'm I'm sorry. I I I regret it. I regret my actions. You know what? It's always excuses, excuses, excuses with you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll do better. I promise to do better. Well, next time you go on thinking left or whatever it's called, just just <laughs> let me know a few months in advance, okay? <laughs> All right, yeah. Uh, and if you feel up for experimenting, maybe we can go on there together sometime. Don't push it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, w- I was on a podcast called Left Thinking, and it goes up on the YouTube channel it's called Sun C with the Z. Uh, and it was a nice talk. We talked about some stuff. We talked about explaining things like very complicated leftist leftist topics to uh you know in a simple way to people who don't oops to people who do, like don't have don't have experience reading academic texts or whatever which is most people yeah no that's awesome um, that's really good yeah. uh, i haven't heard of them before but i'll definitely check them out what did you say they were called yeah zanzi zanzi okay yeah it's spelled uh z a h n z e e Nice. Okay, well, uh, yeah. I will check them out. Um, that sounds great. Work so people yeah. can hear it on their YouTube channel, or yes, it's on. It's on the YouTube's on the YouTube dot com. Ah, I heard that's where all the young kids are these days. I don't really understand it, to be honest. No, it'll probably go Something away. Something about the moving pictures. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how that yeah, stuff. It's works. too complicated for me. Yeah, I prefer to stick to sound and radio. I mean, I barely trust radio, so I, I get what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how does it work? Is there like a tiny man in the box? How do they get the voices into the box with the thing? Yeah. How do they shrink the man to be so tiny? How do, how do they... Is it wires? How do they do it? <laughs> I don't know. All I know is you plug it into the wall. You do? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That explains it. Anyway, yeah. it's Christmas. <laughs> it's Christmas, Azure. It's Christmas. This is the real Christmas episode. You thought the last episode was the Christmas special, but this is the Christmas special, you fucking idiots. Yeah, why would you think just because it's called, like, the Christmas episode that (laughs) that it would be about Christmas, you dum-dums? Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Yeah, you've just been taught a lesson about fake news. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lesson in there somewhere. This is a smart podcast. We are very intellectual. Yeah. Uh, And much like in the last podcast i'm still drinking you must oh sweet yeah so that's a that's a callback go listen to it go back to that last episode (laughs) we're like don't uh, tell anyone peter don't tell anyone that we recorded last episode yesterday oh no see see according to canon this is uh, in close to christmas so yeah today's date is the 19th of December. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so close to Christmas. Oh, yeah, boy. I'm so excited. I've been watching all the Advent calendars. Did you hear about what happened today in the news? Insert news item from December 19th here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's incredible that the president of Serbia did that on live television. Oh, see, now you kind of screwed yourself, because now you have to find something about the <laughs> guy from Serbia. <laughs> 19th. Um, did, did, that's true. The only thing you're going to find is, like, the Serbian president walks his dog or something. You're going to be like, that's crazy I that mean, he that- did that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, that is pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean. He just did that. Where did he get the dog from? It's not even his dog. 
<laughs> he just walked a dog. Yeah. P- Serbia doesn't even have a president. They don't even have dogs in Serbia. <laughs> <laughs> that was so stupid. I bet they do. What are we talking about today, Peter? We're talking about Christmas, of course. Uh, the war on Christmas? Oh, you. Of course. Uh, <laughs> the war on Christmas and, uh, I don't know, eggnog? Trees, mm. music, movies. I've never had eggnog. You haven't? Oh, it's so good. See, the thing is, we don't, uh-huh. we don't have it here either, but you can make it pretty easily yourself. It's very simple. Oh, yeah. You just get some eggs and some milk and some cinnamon. Some... You just get some egg and some yog. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just put some, a bunch, <laughs> just put some, like a bunch of <laughs> nog in there, a bunch of like eggs and some sugar, and then you just stir it around, and you have eggnog sugar, and it's great. Mmm... See, what I like to do is I like to put um, <clears throat> gin, whiskey, um, vodka, uh, schnapps, cocaine, uh, heroin, and milk into a bowl, mix it all mm. together, stir it for a few hours, and then just yeah. uh, pulverize it and sniff it. Yeah. You can also eat it in liquid form with cereal. Oh, yeah, I guess you could. But that... that <laughs> That doesn't sound like something I'd do when extremely high off of alcohol, heroin, and cocaine, though. <laughs> eating cereal? Yeah, eating. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Living. I guess. Living, being alive, and breathing, yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty zoned out when I do that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. No, but, but yeah. yeah, I mean, where should we start? It's, Chris- it's a big topic. Christmas, Santa Claus, Jesus, movies, music. Uh, um, do you like Christmas well, I mean, music? Yeah. Yeah, some really I good like stuff. Christmas music. Yeah. I think my favorite Christmas album is the Phil Spector album. Um mm. I think it's called just a, a very Phil Spector Christmas because he was in uh he was a crazy narcissist. But it was all these um <laughs> like he he did that thing that uh early entertainment business thing of just um finding great uh African American bands and getting mm. them to sign over all their publishing rights and all their yeah. future money to him, and then he would release their albums and cheat them out of a bunch of money. Uh, but it's basically like it's he got all his groups together to record all these classic Christmas songs, and they sound great. Uh, it's also the mm. sound of you know people getting robbed by a, 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 a terrible <laughs> producer guy. But it sounds great. Yeah. It's beautiful. Um, I mean, that is in the spirit of Christmas, is rampant capitalism. Exactly, yeah. Just cheating people out of money, um, being, you know, culturally very dominant over people that, you know, don't, you know, maybe celebrate the same things you. It's, it's very in the spirit yeah. of things. Um, the, the red Santa thing, like the Santa with the white beard and the red coat and that thing, some people say it comes from Coca-Cola, and some people say it actually comes from something else, and Coca-Cola just picked up on it. But either way, uh, that picture of Santa has been spread around the world by, like, American hegemony. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure, like, um, isn't the German Santa green or something? The, German, the G- Germans had, like, fucked up stories about fucking monsters who eat children's innards and stuff around Christmas. Yeah, Krampus, or whatever they call Krampus, him. Krampus, yeah. and yeah, they have, like, a bunch of those monsters which are, like, meant to teach children to be afraid of everything. Yeah, no, Germans have a great folk mystery fairy tale tradition of just making yeah. these children's stories meant to scare the living shit out of children. Uh, yeah. To make them behave or whatever and not be too loud while the parents are drunk. Yeah. And yeah. in Sweden, we have in in Sweden we call Christmas presents julklappar, which means Christmas claps uh-huh. or Christmas slaps. Okay, and that's because <laughs> uh, that's because in ye olden days you might get a present by someone throwing it to your door and it slaps against your door. What? And so it's a <laughs> Christmas slap. That's... It because so or a Christmas knock, I guess. It's like. Someone throws a Christmas present at your door and it knocks on the door, and then that's, huh. that's how you get a present. That's a very aggressive way to give someone something. <laughs> like, you mean a lot to me! You mean so much to me! <laughs> take it! Take this gift! You Swedish person, you mean so much to me! I really appreciate you! I mean, you know, it's like how in America, <clears throat> the little kids on the bikes, they do the news deliveries and they throw the newspaper on the doors. Yeah, yeah. 
It's like that, only with Christmas presents. I don't know what kind of Christmas presents they would have given out in the fucking 1300s or whenever that story came from. Probably like, guess, like uh, wooden logs. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> like uh, p- things they whittled out of tree, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like a, a whittled tree doll. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. Isn't that what a thing That's they funny. did back in the day, like whittled a lot? I, yeah, I wasn't around. Yeah, I was, but I was very drunk at the time. <laughs> uh. Uh, we have these, so we we didn't we never have a, had a Santa in in Swedish lore, um, but we had Tomtenisar, which means like Santa gnomes, I guess. Uh huh. Which were like these little dwarf guys who ran around and they lived on the farm, uh, and they did stuff. I think they ate a lot of porridge. Sweet. Uh, something about wooden spoons. Uh-huh. I can't really remember, but we had those. They didn't give you presents, they were just sort of around. Huh. And I think you put out porridge for them. All right. Yeah. In Denmark, we, we don't yeah. really... I, I have no idea about our own mythology, what we had from, you know, back yeah. in the day. But there is a big trend, or was at least, a thing about, like, Norwegian gnomes. For some reason. Mm-hmm. Like, the tree gnomes and Christmas gnomes of Norway. Uh, yeah. I couldn't a lot begin. of gnomes in, in like Scandinavian and German folklore. Yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of gnome and like, I guess also like fairies is a thing in Sweden, right? You, you have a, yeah, like, yeah, we, fairies and gnolls and weird things. Yeah. That live, mostly just live in the forest. I think a lot of them, a lot of the stories were just created so that kids wouldn't just walk out into the forest alone. You know what, that does make sense, yeah. And also makes sense why yeah. we also then wouldn't have it, because we don't... I, I, I guess, like, traditionally we haven't had a lot of forest ground. Like yeah. Forested areas in Denmark. You might have something about, like, lakes or something. Uh, or just things that are dangerous that you don't want kids around. You might have mythology about that, like, don't go in the lakes alone because the lake gnome will get you and eat your toes. Yeah, I'm, I'm blanking on Danish mythology in general i feel like we but this is it's probably wrong but i feel like we don't have a lot of mythology in denmark that's specifically danish maybe maybe a lot of it's the same as in german i would guess because you You might have just like you might have just had mythology but then it just disappeared yeah oh wait i guess like yeah we do have a lot of mythology surrounding like children dying um (laughs) that's that's a real thing because mortality especially childhood mortality in denmark until about a hundred years ago was insanely high because there was a lot of um like people were horrendously abused by industrialization and before that the king had very uh strict control over everything and and no one had any rights basically to do anything and if you were born into mm. a, if you if you were born into a place you were going to die that place working the same job as your dad etc cetera, etc cetera. it was very <laughs> it, was, it was very dire That's, being yeah. a dane back then um, and yeah. a lot of, like, um, Hans Christian Andersen wrote one of the stories that I still think is one of the saddest stories that I'll ever read called The Little Matchstick Girl, I think it's called. And I feel like that's yeah, a very, I've heard of that. yeah, that's a, that's a very Danish mythology type story about how if you're not careful, um, you can die starving alone at the age of five. Yeah. yeah. There is a, so I looked it up on, on Wikipedia. There's a Wikipedia page called Danish Folklore. Oh. Interestingly, there's no Danish language version of this page. There's only the English one. And then in Spanish and what I think is in like Ukrainian or something. Macedonian. Huh. For some reason. Uh, and it, it actually says that it's recognized that only a fraction of the sources can be traced back further than the Renaissance. Yeah. It's because a lot of it was, was oral history. Like. Not a lot of Danish folklore was ever written down, and so it's just been lost to the ages. You know what? That makes a lot of sense. That does make a lot of sense. And also, yeah, like I said, a lot. I feel like a lot. Like, I looked up, and I think in 1933, um, more than half of all the people living in Denmark were essentially slave labor on farms. Like, you were, if you, like, mm. you couldn't move. Like, you were required yeah, by the um, king to stay where you were born until you died. We had a similar system. It was uh, statare, I think they were called. Stoutspun in Danish. Literally just yeah. like uh, homestead bound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it was something akin to uh, you weren't paid in money, but you were paid in 
the things that the farm produced and you were like owned by the farm itself you weren't a slave to one person but you were like a you were like bound to the farm or yeah you're like a complicated system it, yeah you were like a slave to your community it was very feudal almost yeah, yeah. it was very yeah i mean it was a remnant of feudalism yeah it was yeah uh, it was we got rid of it in the 30s i think but then after that was uh removed there was a, a period of of mass nostalgia also for that system because industrialization was way worse in Denmark mm. than the feudal system was, and the mortality rates were even even crazier uh, than they yeah. were back back in the days of you know semi feudalism because this was of course you know at the very beginning of of the industrial age and everyone was just living in dirt and you know uh, yeah. there weren't any safety regulations for anything so you just subjected people to whatever I mean, just, just the disease and shit going around at the time. yeah it's really no surprise someone like, like Marx came out in that time. Because this is also there's like no one got any money. Yeah. Everything was so expensive. You had no rights. People were dying at the age of what thirty one, working in these yeah. awful, awful conditions, nightmarish, a hellscape cities. So it was just ugh. Yeah, yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Yeah, this is the the real <laughs> Christmas episode. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah Very uh, Scandinavian it's Christmas. Like <laughs> I mean, yeah. There is only yeah, death is. waiting for you. I mean that is that is part of our Germanic heritage is making up stories and talking about things during the holidays which are fucking terrifying. Yeah, and sad. Like an old lady who when you're naughty comes to you at night, opens up your stomach and eats your organs. That's a real German folktale. I can't remember it was like Frau something. Yeah. Something. Like if you really want to get depressed, read some like Swedish, Danish, German uh, folk tales because they're, they're, they're like very yeah. sad the vast majority of them end with the protagonist dying or being dismembered or <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's really yeah. sad it's really it's really awful but yeah that's that's just how we got our children to learn to i guess be miserable back then yeah today all children learn from christmas is that they want material things like ipads and the only thing that matters is presents. Oh yeah, and things, and consumerism, and commercials, and sales. Uh, so that's nice. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, because that's obviously the best economic system, and the best, most interesting way to live life is to constantly like mm. be worried about how much money you have, and never be satisfied, and always just keep chasing money. And always be. In I debt. can't actually um, feel happiness without buying uh, an iPad every Christmas. Yeah, no, those. It's it's like um, it's it's like. Have you ever shot like a whole lot of heroin? Yes, a lot. Yes, of course, uh, daily. Yeah, no, I yeah, I figured, but yeah, it's it's like that for about point mm. one second, like zero point one second, yeah. like a just like a t like a tiny bit of just. Like a little bit of happiness is squeezed into your brain and then immediately <laughs> replaced by just like the most crippling anxiety and depression that you spent all this money on like a dumb bracelet or like a, a belt you didn't need that's made from like crocodile leather that you can't wear in public because PETA will put paint on your body. <laughs> PETA agents will fucking <laughs> hit your knees with a baseball bat. Oh yeah, yeah. I can't wear any of my mink collection outside these days. No, that's terrible. What has society come to? I know. How, how will I get my 0 0.1 seconds of happiness now? If I don't know that, <laughs> that like, uh, animals have suffered tremendously to make me happy for a split second. Look, Peter, you know the feeling when you get like a phone or, or a iPad or a computer or something and you open it up and you get to peel the plastic off? That is a great feeling. Yeah, that's worth the five thousand dollars I spend on shit every Christmas. You know what? It is. I almost forgot the true meaning of Christmas: the plastic bit of the iPad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting to peel things off. New electronic products. That's the real meaning of Christmas. And we're only twenty minutes into this episode, and we already found oh, it. we already found it. What are we going to talk about now? <laughs> you know what? You know what I found out is um. One of the main gripes that the Catholic Church has with Lutheranism and most of the mainstream Protestant churches 
is that the after the service uh the protestant churches throw out the pieces of like the the pellet things that they say is the body of christ and the catholic church is really mad about this because they literally believe that it's the body of christ so they're like they're throwing jesus out with the trash what the hell man (laughs) so what they do is they have these containers these holy containers that they store away for the next service because they they don't believe in ever throwing out the body of christ and that's like their big selling point to new people coming into the faith is we actually believe this stuff that Jesus said about it turning into the body of Christ. And yeah. Have you ever studied the, um, oh God, the Council of Chalcedon? Oh, uh, remind me. So in the Roman Empire under uh, Constantine, there were a few splits in the Christian church, like with the Arians and the Donatists, who, among other things, they believed that or well one of them believed that uh, yeah so the donatists believed that jesus was not a man but a spirit because they believed that god could not be a man right right because of the trinity so jesus is god but they believe that god cannot be a human because humans are sinful and god can't sin right so therefore jesus was a spirit and he only appeared to us to have been a man and the 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 roman not yet catholic but the chalcedon and also not yet chalcedonian but the mainstream christian church in rome said that this was a heresy because the because it neglects the importance of jesus sacrificing himself and dying for our sins because a spirit can't you know be crucified you can't crucify a spirit a spirit can't die so um in the bible and in a lot of christian early christian texts from this period uh, uh people talk about the importance of of believing in jesus christ in the flesh right yeah and that phrase in the flesh is a stab at the donatists that's interesting. I, had, I, I don't think I've heard that before. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so part of eating, you know, this body of Christ is about believing in Jesus Christ as existing in the flesh, as dying for our sins as a mortal man. That's interesting. Uh, and not as a spirit. Because it also says in the Bible to do it. Jesus said, do mm. this, you know, eat, the, eat my body and drink my blood and you yeah. shall become one with but, me. But I mean, a lot of the Bible was written way after Jesus died, so that might as well have been written in the Roman Empire. Well, I mean, during I, yeah, depending on who you ask, obviously, yeah. Um, it was yeah. written way after his death. Everyone ag- agrees with that. It's like a, an oral tradition going you know, yeah. uh, ahead before it was actually written down. That's true. Um, but I'm ac- Some yeah. parts of the Bible, which were originally part of the Bible, were taken out by the Catholic Church because they didn't like, fit the narrative or whatever and they were just destroyed. Hmm. So there are books of the Bible which we have never read because the church has destroyed them because they didn't think they should have been part of the original Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, they were of questionable... I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to believe when it comes to that stuff. I've heard a lot about how the Bible came to be and stuff, but I'm actually, I'm reading a really interesting book at the moment called Mythologies by Edith Hamilton. It's, it's an old book about, um, about uh, the uh, Greeks, the ancient Greeks and their gods, and it's actually really good. And it's written mm. in a very like enthusiastic and involved manner, which is very pleasant to read still today. And it's interesting, like she makes some very good points about uh, how the Greeks made their gods. They were very revolutionary for their time because they, they were the first ones that we know of to make the gods in their own image. So the, yeah. the gods looked like them and they could mock their gods and they could relate to yeah. their gods. They weren't like these monsters or, you know, these uh, uh, half human, half, you know, they were like half, but, but they were kind of like, they were evolving into modern religious takes of, of, um, of, um, of, of religion. And it doesn't really surprise me mm. that um, there would be this split of, you know, spirits, which is more probably in the Roman tradition of gods, where they would be, like, more, Mm. you know, um, removed from humanity, looking down at humanity, and the the more maybe maybe Greco-Judaic tradition of taking 
uh, and making like gods in like accepting that gods could be like humans but above them. You know. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Something interesting about uh, ancient Greek religion. Uh, I could be completely misunderstanding Greek re- ancient Greek religion because I mean I haven't studied it at all. But my understanding is that they they believe that the gods lived on Mount Olympus, right? Yeah, Olympus at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that the gods were just sort of up there. Well, I mean, they kind of lived all over, but yeah, they congregated yeah. on Olympus. Yeah. Yeah. But no one ever, like, went there to meet them or to, like, check if it was true that they were there? Yeah, but the thing is, too, that um, one of the things I'm learning about the ancient Greeks is that Olympus is never clearly defined as to what it is. It's never really Uh, clearly defined if it really is a mountain or if it's, like, more of a mental state place. Uh, The mm. the places where it's actually mentioned as a mountain, it's kind of contradicted in the same text as being a mountain. So it's more like, uh, Mm. I think it's more like an analogy to... I think they more mean like a mountainous area or like some places, some of the the later uh, Greek texts even mention it as something akin to heaven, like raised above earth or something. But some people have like traced down and come up with suggestions for what it might be uh, like. And and it Mm. might like they do have a Mount Olympus, which they think might be like it's literally named after the myths of Olympus. And they're like, it's probably this one. Like, yeah, Mm. why not? but we don't I really thought, know. I just thought it would be really funny if, like, everyone in Greece was just like, oh, yeah, the gods, they all live up on that hill over there. And then some guy is like, oh, really, can I, you know, has anyone ever gone there to, like, see them or meet them? And everyone's like, no, but they're there. Yeah, it it is interesting, like, because they do have these very, like, there's um uh, a story of a Pegasus, and it described in the story exactly where it slept at night. Like, it's right over by that hill. And we do have geographical locations, and we know that the people were aware of the place that they were describing in their stories. And they're like, yeah, the Pegasus sleeps over there at night. And people were, like, the thing is, like, the reason no one checked, according to Edith Hamilton at least, is because the world was a very dangerous place to to people at the time, because we didn't know what wilderness and what um, monsters lurked Mm -hmm. in the shadow and in the sea and whatever. So people were very willing to believe these stories because... The world was very small, and especially in Greece with all these tiny community societies, people didn't really communicate with the outside world, and everything surrounding them was just like their people and a bunch of ocean. So they didn't really yeah. know a lot. Like in a, in a, very, in a very primitive way, they were, that they were extremely smart and had these incredible stories for a, a people that was still so primitively isolated from the rest of the world. Something which is interesting about... Uh, something I heard about the the ancient people who lived in the area which is today like the Levant, like the the coast to the Mediterranean in the Middle East. Yeah, that the people who lived there, um, they believed that the Earth was like it was this land, uh, and there was like this continent basically, because they you know they. They had explored a fair bit around the Middle East, and they were like, yeah, okay, that's pretty much what the world is. And then, around around this continent of land, there was an endless ocean. Because to them, from, from their perspective, you know, they had an, the Mediterranean, they had the ocean on the one end, and, you know, they couldn't see any land anywhere else, and their boats weren't that great, so they couldn't really go anywhere. So they were just thinking, well, it's probably just ocean this way forever oh yeah and then you know they went to like uh the persian gulf and they were like there's a bunch of water here too that's probably the other this is probably the edge of the world so the world probably is like this one continent and then there's ocean surrounding it and just like the default state of the universe is just ocean oh yeah Um, oh yeah and so in, in the bible when they talk about genesis they talk about how God create like he like the earth was just a dark sea, or like I don't know if it's actually in Genesis now or if it was like in the original Genesis or something, but like something that we can interpret from the original Hebrew. Right, right, right. But like how when the, when God first created the world, the only thing that existed was uh, darkness and a giant sea which stretched out for infinity. Mm. And then God said, you know, let there be light. And there was light, but there was no land. So then he created land. That's an interesting just, interpretation. Just, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So there's just like this, um, 
to, to in their minds like the default state of the universe, which is like an endless sea, just endless water forever. Yeah. And then there was land every now and then. That does make sense. Yeah. No, I I, w- I would buy that. Yeah. And there's a reason, like uh, as you mentioned, because the Greeks believed that the world was basically just water and a little bit of land. Uh, like yeah. um, Poseidon was the second most important god in all of the ancient Greek yeah. mythology. Because yeah. obviously, if you controlled the water, you control the world, and you were the one yeah, that. You because, know. like, if you if you imagine, like, you are in Greece, in you know ancient history. Mm. And you like look uh, across the Mediterranean Sea, and you've heard of people who like try to go out in boats and to see like what's on the other edge of the sea. No one can get to Northern Africa from Greece in the ancient era. No, 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 no. So like to you, you probably believe that you know that way it's probably just sea forever. Like what else would there be? You're like there's no land. I can't see any land. You go out with a boat, you never reach land. It's probably just sea forever. I mean, that would be the logical com- conclusion at the time, because if you tried to go north, you would be greeted by very rough terrain and territory, which wouldn't easily be uh, trespassed at the time. Like you couldn't just if like if you were someone who maybe was born in Italy or someone who was born mm. in even like the early uh, German territories, you could you could easily discover that. Like you would, you would probably come to the conclusion that the vast, ma- like all of the Earth, is basically land, and there's a little bit of water every once in a while. Yeah. But because they, like, you were in this, and and a lot of the the Greeks lived on islands, so again, they were yeah. literally surrounded by water, and it was it's very easy because with the primitive technology as well, you wouldn't be able mm-hmm. to just travel all across Europe as a Greek person either. You would be very and uh, and and I I remember now there were some Greek people who actually went to Egypt via the land route, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't think uh, Greek people ever traveled to northern Africa over the sea. And, like there were some like early maps of the Mediterranean which some Greek scholars made. I can't remember when they made it, but I'm talking like way before that time. Oh yeah, yeah, you know by the time the Greek mythology, like myths of the gods and that kind of stuff were start to be created. Yeah. And and yeah, it's it's also interesting t- tracking the Greek mythology myths over time because um near the end of the of the ancient era, the myths and stories written about the Greek gods became more and more comedic. Like they stopped taking mm. the gods stories so seriously as they became more technologically advanced. So they more or less all turned into like slapstick comedy stories near the end. Uh, and in the yeah. very beginning, there was a lot of reverence for them because you were afraid of them. Like there's a, there's a story of, uh, they would explain why volcanoes erupted based off of the fact that they believed someone was forging armor for the gods inside the volcanoes. Yeah. Hepastus. Yeah, exactly. So, but, but people kind of stopped believing that as they became more technologically advanced and they were replaced by different myths and different explanations as both science mm-hmm. evolved technology and understanding of the world around them and as they were you know visited by different tribes of people and that came from different lands with different stories yeah but it is it is a miracle in so many ways that we even have those greek myths and legends because they could have been lost to time so many times over but they really are beautiful stories speaking of ancient greece um, Epicurus was a, an ancient Greek philosopher. He sure was, and he actually he actually started the war on Christmas. That's true. Did you know that? He did. Yeah. No, I know. I yeah. I saw it on um, Hannity. Yeah. Yep. Because he actually he hated consumerism, so he actually hated America. Yeah, he hated America before yeah. America was even discovered. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, I saw this um, this documentary about. Neo Epicureans mm-hmm. it was like this tiny group of people who like held on to Epicurean beliefs and stuff, which is interesting. But like by the end, I think what they they talked about like Epicurus and his critique of happiness and his critique of not his critique of happiness, but his critique of how people reach happiness mm-hmm. and specifically his critique of consumerism. Yeah, and by the end, like what they did at the end of the documentaries, I think they like printing out this massive billboard in like a mall that said like consumerism is bad or something yeah <laughs> stupid like that yeah 
Well, I mean, the the problem with Epicur- Epicurus, as well as a lot of the most, if not all of the ancient philosoph- philosophers who, and people who wrote uh, histories and myths, is that we only have very few fragments of them left. Yeah, with Epicurus, that's a huge problem. Yeah. Most of what we know about Epicurus is from, I can't remember his name, but he, there was a friend who met Epicurus yep. and who wrote down uh, a lot of the stuff Epicurus believed uh, after just like talking to him. And then that is like the record we have of what Epicurus believed. And then his actual writings, we only have like one or two of like his 100 books he wrote. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So most of it is just gone. And Which yeah, it's, it really is a shame. And a lot of, I know that a lot of philosophers are really bummed out about it because it is believed in the philosophic world that he was a genius when it came to not just uh, like economic or um, like uh, moral philosophy, but also in his interpretations of Platonism and all these things. It's believed that he was because people kind of refer to him as this genius that kind of intellectually yeah. surpassed the likes of Plato and, and Socrates, but we really yeah. don't know he anything. He could have been a dumbass. He could have been a total dumbass, and he, <laughs> it's all hype, because people are yeah. just like, this dude looks, this dude's cool, like, he speaks good, and then his writings could be mm. dumb, like, worse than Hegel's or whatever, but still, like, it could yeah. <laughs> shade thrown. Anyway, no, but, um, yeah, we, we simply don't know, and it's a real shame, because it is keeping a lot of universities and philosophers from talking about Epicurus because, again, we only have very few fragments of his writings left. All we know about him yeah. is kind of what other people said about him and these small yeah. amounts of fragments saved by Islamic scholars. Our understanding of what Epicurus believed about Plato is that, or like the, the contemporary philosophers of Greek at the time and of Athens, specifically he talked of Athens, mm. uh, is that they... A lot like Diogenes' critique of Plato is that the philosophers talked about things which didn't matter. Mm-hmm. For instance, how do you define a man in the fewest words possible? Oh, it's a featherless biped. And Epicurus kind of looked at that and said, okay, that's stupid. I'm going to do philosophy about how to be happy because that's a lot more practical. And like, that's basically the end of his critique of Plato that we know of. He probably had lots more to say, but we just have no idea. I mean, he probably, like, to reach that conclusion, he would have had to think about it a lot. And yeah. you, you would suspect he wrote about it if he, if he thought that deeply about <laughs> yeah. it, right? I mean, Epicurus, one of the main things Epicurus believed, uh, probably because he was a philosopher, but it was that um, to reach... To be happy, one of the things you have to do is you have to think about philosophy and you have to write about philosophy. And that was one of the big things that they did at the, the school slash commune which he created. Mm-hmm. Um, something interesting about that. So Epicurus created this commune, which was like a proto-anarchist commune where students came to work. Like they worked the fields, they grew, they grew their own food, they dug their own well and whatever. Like everything was taken care of communally. People took turns doing work. And then during the days, there was like this rule that you, you're not allowed to eat dinner alone. If you're eating dinner, you have to eat it with someone and you have to have a conversation about philosophy. Uh. Because that, Epicurus believed, was like that's one of the major keys to happiness is you have to talk to people. You have to talk to interesting people about interesting topics. That's like a big part of being human to him. It's like that's how you reach happiness is you talk about inter- interesting things with interesting people. You know what? We should begin calling people who believe in that communists or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Marx, Marx took a lot of inspiration from Epicurus for his philosophy. Marx wrote a thesis about Epicurus actually, which is very interesting to read. Yeah. And I mean like when you read a lot of his and there aren't even a lot, but when you read the stuff that Marx wrote about what communism really was, it seems way more inspired by the likes of Epicurus than Hegel. Because, yeah, yeah, he- yeah, Hegel totally. wouldn't like communism, I'm pretty sure. No, he was not. He was very into the state and very into big, you know, institutional, uh, like, uh, a very like like liberal way of organizing society where these big government institutions would deal with the problems instead of the people yeah, yeah. Uh, so so these epicurean communes um during epicurus's life and after he died they actually started catching on and other people started opening up their own communes and i believe that 
by the end, there were a few hundred communes structured like uh, Epicurus's school all around the Mediterranean. And then Christianity came and turned them all into churches. Wasn't it the Romans first, though? And then Christianity? Well, it was the, the Roman Christians, I believe. Really? Because I, I thought it was, yeah. um, you know, the, the Romans came to Greece and then took the gods and turned them into their own gods and turned Greece into a structure that's more like the Roman Empire and then way later Christianity. I don't think the Romans ever touched the Epicurean schools. I think the Epicurean schools were left alone during the Romans, but then when Christianity came, they were turned into churches. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because, I mean, the, the Romans, you know, say what you want about the Romans, they were fairly, in most of the places they conquered, they, like, let culture be pretty, you know, they sort of let it be. Mm. And, like, you know, they, they like taking gods for themselves. Yes. Like, oh, these gods are cool, we'll add them to the Pantheon. But they didn't, like, force their religion upon the places they conquered. Really. Well, I know that they, they made the Greeks stop doing the Olympics when they invaded, mm, but yeah. I, I really don't know much about that aspect of Greek and Roman history. To be honest, I always found the Roman Empire kind of boring. Uh, mm. f to be honest, like just as a, as a history, I like, I like some of the stories of the time, but I don't, I never really found it. Like some people are really into the Roman Empire uh, and cool yeah. if you're one of those people. It just never really diddled my skittle, if you will. Yeah, I think there are, there are plenty of interesting aspects of the Roman Empire and then plenty of things which are very boring. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, a lot of the stories, it's like Beatles songs, you know? They've just been played over and over again. It's like whenever you talk about mm. philosophy or history or anything, people always want to talk about the Nazis or the Romans. Like, those are the two main yeah. things, right? And I get it. It's an interesting think, time, but it's also like... What's really interesting about Rome is that they were kind of the first multi-ethnic empire which was, like, properly centralized. Yeah. Um, which are like central laws which the entire empire had to follow. Like, yeah, we had the... Actually, the Mongol Empire was in the fucking 1200s, never mind. Like, yeah, the Roman Empire was pretty much the first of its kind, where it was this huge place, and, like, they had roads, and they had postal services, and you could communicate with people all across the empire, even though it was so big. And it kind of laid the foundations for, like, modern state building. Because, mm. you know, obviously... Things like Senate comes from Latin because then that's it's based on the Roman Republic yes. and the Roman political system. I think it's the Roman Empire is very important, uh, even if it's not interesting to everyone. Yeah, I think I think my main my main issue with the Roman Empire from like an empiricist point of view is they they read more like a covers band than an actual thing of their own. Like <laughs> yeah. because like you mentioned, pretty much every aspect of their civilization was just like invading stuff, taking stuff from the places they invaded and incorporating it into their own system. So it's like the Senate you mentioned, the, 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 the way they ruled for a long time was just basically like a, a carbon copy of the uh, ancient Greek Athen system, the early democracy mm. type stuff in the Senate and that, kind, that, that way of ruling. And the armors were inspired by the people they invaded uh, other places and stuff like it just it's like uh, it, yeah. it, it's it's not it doesn't seem to me like a thing of their own as much it's just more like a mishmash of early history in an empire which I mean cool like there's a bunch of cool stuff about the Roman Empire you can study but I, I just I don't find it as satisfying to read about as other times in history or other like philosophical eras in human history. And also, like, I like that you almost sort of called the Roman Empire woke for being multi-ethnic. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> like, uh, they had slaves and stuff. That was just more of a... Because the, um, the definition of empire fluctuates a lot, but one which comes back time and time again in history is that it's a country which incorporates multiple ethnicities yes. or multiple cultural groups. I wasn't saying that Rome was like woke or anything. They treated plenty of people very badly. Oh yeah, no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It's just very easy to read that into what you just said. Like it's a it's a woke yeah, empire no. because like it was it was pretty <laughs> awful, like pretty pretty terrible and repressive and like classist mm. and yeah. But yeah, I know what you meant. Just to to make it clear, Rome yeah. fucking invented classes basically. Oh yeah, yeah, they love their classes. Yeah, again, very mm. inspired by Plato. 
Mm. We're yeah. very smart, aren't we? We're so smart. We're just like, Why are we so smart? Yes. And also, uh, one more bad thing about Rome. They didn't even celebrate Christmas. Yeah, what's up with that? They didn't buy presents. They didn't go to the Mall of America and buy the Wii U. They didn't do any of that. Are you saying that the Roman Empire is woke because they're rejecting Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying the Roman Empire was un-American. Yeah, I can get behind that. Yeah, yeah. They they sh they should they shouldn't kneel in the football games. <laughs> <laughs> Did the Romans play football? When was football invented? That's a great question. American football probably is like an offshoot of rugby, which I would guess is probably like an English thing, right, or a Scottish thing or something. Irish. I think it was Scottish originally. Yes. Something. Something. Hang on. History of American football. Um, oh no, there's actually an ancient Greek ball game. No way. Really? Uh, called Episkyros. Episkyros. It translates to common ball. It was an ancient Greek ball game. Highly teamwork oriented. The game was played between two teams, usually 12 to 14 players each, with one ball and the rules of the game, which allowed using hands. We don't really know all that much about it. Uh, judging from this Wikipedia page. So it could be literally anything, but people are choosing to believe that it has something to do with American football. There are a few depictions of it. There's a guy, he has a ball, there's a goalpost. Uh, it says that in Sparta, the game was violent, which makes sense because it's Sparta. Hell yeah. They would try to throw the ball over the heads of the other team. Uh, there was a white line called the Skuros between the teams. Uh, it's I mean, it feels pretty vague, the rules of this. Um, but, I mean, it's a ball game, so I guess that might be... Yeah, it. I'm choosing to believe that this is just communist propaganda, and really it's based off rugby. Yeah. Yeah. That makes more sense to me, anyway. I mean, just looking at the, <laughs> the history of football in general, it seems like people all across the world have, at numerous times in history come up with the idea of having a ball and playing some sort of sports game with it. And, like, the football we have today, both American and, and non-American, um, are just, like, amalgamations of all of these different games which have existed throughout history. Yeah. I'm not going to throw yet another tangent at you and talk about it, but Theodore Roosevelt, like, basically um, reinvented football because it got too violent in the U.S., um, look it up, listener, if you're interested hmm. in that. It's a, it's an awesome, very epic story about how a president forced and 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 <laughs> like the the uh, National Football League to change its rules and basically came up with his own rules for the game and made them use his rules. Anyway, Christmas. Oh boy, Christmas. We've talked for almost. <laughs> Can an you hour. imagine if Obama did that? I'm sorry, but could you imagine? That would be cool. Like if, if Obama was just like. The football is too violent. We have to change the rules of football. That would rule so much, though. They'd call it Obama ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Republicans would go fucking insane. Oh, could you imagine? I, th I think it even started because uh, Roosevelt's son got injured or something, and he was like, listen, guys. <laughs> this is too <laughs> much. So, yeah. I don't know. It's a different time. Theodore Roosevelt, an incredible president to read about. Uh, if you if you if you're into that stuff, uh, so what are you gonna do this Christmas, Peter? This Christmas, I am going to be with my family, just like my my mom and dad and fifty strippers and the the usual stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. Are the strippers part of your family? Oh no. Oh yeah, because that would be that weird. would be so strange. I mean, not that you would have strippers in your family, but that you would call your sisters strippers how yeah. and also that you have 50 of them that's pretty that's a lot you know my 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 parents had a lot of children um they started when they were three years old and they just kept going mm -hmm. through menopause and everything yeah i have mm -hmm. like 70 brothers and sisters i think it's very confusing because yeah. they're all called mark even the girls <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they were they're they're simple folk my family yeah mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, the strippers aren't related to us. And, uh, mm. yeah, we decided to do, uh, just, you know, immediate family. So just me, my parents, 50 strippers and my, one of my brothers, the oh, yeah. 69 others are all, uh, away on business. 
<laughs> yeah. They have their suits and the suitcases. They're on the planes. They're going to America to do the business. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, ironically, they're all like um, having uh, very sad children's Christmas movies written about their lives right now. Yeah. Um, yeah they're very uh, absent fathers, all of them. And they all mm. say stuff like, I have an important meeting to their children all the time. <laughs> I can't come to your soccer game. I have a meeting. Yeah. I love the generic business daddy movie. It's great. <laughs> in like the 90s and early 2000s. It's so great. They're always wearing a suit and always like uh, the, this tie is always slightly, slightly loose yeah. because they're stressed out. And they have like the big phones. Yeah. The. And like, no, Peterson, I told you, you can't do it that way. Oh, no, I have to go back to the office. Ugh. My boss is such a hard ass. He's making me come back in and do the numbers again. I'm telling you, I'm going to quit one of these days, Melanie. <laughs> I'm sorry, kids. I can't be here on Christmas Eve because my boss wants me to work again. But don't worry, Timmy. I will show up to your big game. Except maybe I won't. I promise. <laughs> I promise I'll be there for your birthday. I promise. I promise. I promise. If there's anything in my life that I will do, it is show up to your birthday. I can't make it to your birthday. I'm sorry. <laughs> I bet nothing happens that will make me have a change of heart and become a better father. <laughs> 90s children's movies rocked. They were all pretty much the same thing. It was like parents, huh? Yeah. Like it was all like, Ugh, parents, am I right? <laughs> Always going to meetings and talking on phones. Ugh. Yeah. I don't know if I ever, like, realized as a kid when I was watching those films that, like, these are all the same movie. Yeah. Like, these are all about the same thing. But it's, I don't know. Yeah, it's I basically like the same story over and over again with a different setting. Uh, yeah. yeah. Even Home Alone Home is Alone basically... Home Alone and all yeah. those. <laughs> How did we come up with the same example at the same time? That rule... <laughs> <laughs> yeah well because i was just thinking about his dad and how when they were in new york and his dad was in the hotel room and he yelled and the uh kevin was in like central park and he could hear it somehow which was because I mean, he's so stressed out from all the work and all the meetings yeah it's all the business is doing in new york and when you talk to with donald trump who's in that movie yeah he's he's great he's great in that movie he's <laughs> standing around being like hey kid what are you, why are you standing here being a kid? That's annoying. Okay, we'll go outside now. Bye. That's, yeah. kind, that's honestly like the one role I would want in a children's movie. It's just to be a guy yeah. in suit coming in going, Hey kid, why are you a kid here? Shouldn't be a kid here. Go outside now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good role. To I mean, just be like the generic fun killer. It's like the lifeguard who's telling you not to play with the ball. Which is like <laughs> the the generic grown up who's telling you not to do something which you think is fun. Yeah, and to get out of that's it. the that's the role you would want in a children's movie because you just get to be cartoonishly yeah. evil for no reason and no provocation. Yeah, you're just like, hey kid, you can't be a kid inside this very fancy store. This is a fancy store, <laughs> not a kid store. Yeah. You annoying kid, get out of here with your kiddiness. This isn't a circus. <laughs> get out of here. Hey, I see you kids having fun. Stop having fun now. You can't eat chocolate in here. This is the the fancy painting store. Inside this store, we only eat broccoli. <laughs> this is the broccoli and no fun store. Yeah. You can't play volleyball on the beach. What if <laughs> this is my beach. You can't play volleyball on my beach. All we do here is uh, look at art. <laughs> Read the newspaper. Yeah, this is the newspaper beach, boys. <laughs> Oh, oh, and those scenes where, like, the kids are, like, doing grown-up things, or, like, pretending to do grown-up things, like, reading the newspaper or whatever. Yeah, that's the best, because that, those, you know those jokes were put in there for the parents. Yeah. Have you noticed, this is, I don't know if you, if, if this is the thing everyone knows, but, like, in, in those movies, um, where the, you have the evil, stop having fun characters, they're always married, and they're always in an abusive relationship with their partner. Mm. Go back and like watch yeah. the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation and stuff. It's always like a very like unhealthy, tense, terrible situation inside their households. 
They're always just like, shut up, Melanie, I'm going to look at this. Or like, no, I'm not going to do this. No, stop, stop yammering all the time. Like, it's always this, they're not just terrible to kids. They're also terrible to their romantic partners and their family and stuff. It's a great little feature. I feel like almost all romantic relationships depicted in those kids' films are pretty unhealthy in one way or another. That's true. Like the father being very absent. Yeah, they're just like, yeah. Not just from his kids, but like from his wife as well, who's left to like deal with the kids. Yeah, I guess, yeah. They have like 15 kids. That's true, but they at least have like, they're like well-meaning terrible people. Like they they have hearts of gold underneath the terrible behavior. At least if you trust the movie. Um, But yeah, Mm -hmm. like the the bad people are just bad in those movies like they're just there's no redeeming qualities to them and they like yeah. they they built them up in such a way that you're happy with them like getting electrocuted at the end or something yeah yeah exactly what, you know, the fucking lifeguard at the beach just fucking dies at the yeah. end <laughs> all the kids all the kids get up and electrocute his testicles until he dies and it's just like you get a tight shot of his face going <laughs> and then he's dead and all the kids are playing volleyball yeah. on his beach <laughs> that's the role you want in a movie that's so true though that's the goal of every actor is to be that guy who gets electrocuted <laughs> and dies at the end um hello my name is peter rhodes and i'm reading for testicle shock uh bodyguard <laughs> Okay, can I do the face? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, oh, it's like fucking um, those comedy movies, like in Paul Bart Mall Cup or whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, just hello, I'm Peter Rhodes. I'm reading for Fat <laughs> Mall Cup number 46. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading for a fat mall patrolling guy who gets kicked in the nuts and makes a fucking funny face and falls to the Number ground. 46, yeah. Uh, number 46. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's all like, uh, it's all like uh, I'm reading for a uh, disgusting, terrible, gross human being, uh, normal day worker cop. <laughs> like, it's mm-hmm. always like, the, the thing about Adam Sandler movies that's so great is that he just hates working people. You just, you can just tell yeah. from all his movies, everyone who just like has an everyday normal job, he just feels like they're not only just dumb, but despicable and disgusting people. Like, it's always just like teachers are vapid and evil and want to hurt children and like mall cop security guards are gross and obese and disgusting and perverted and like literally every type of job like unless you're adam sandler in an adam sandler movie you're a horrible human being <laughs> yeah uh, have you seen um christmas with the cranks cramps uh it has dan Aykroyd in it I think you've talked about it before. I don't think I've actually seen it. It's this uh, Christmas movie. I can't remember who made it. I don't. Uh, Isn't it a Dan Aykroyd movie? I think you told me about Dan it. Dan Aykroyd is in it. I don't know if he directed it. He did a bunch of terrible movies in the 80s and 90s on, on his own after he kind of creatively broke up with John Landis, which was a terrible decision. Uh, Dan Aykroyd is in it. It was directed by Joe Roth. Joe who? Joe Roth. Joe Roth. That sounds like a fake name. Yeah. <laughs> um, with her daughter away, the Cranks decide to skip Christmas altogether until she decides to come home, causing an uproar when they have to celebrate the holiday at the last minute. So uh. basically, it's these two parents have a kid, and she's going away during Christmas to spend Christmas somewhere else. And they're like, Christmas is a really stressful holiday. We have to do all this stuff. And, like, I'm really not feeling up for it. I feel like you and I, we could just go on a vacation somewhere and just, like, have a nice, relaxing time just for us. Mm. Uh, And then the entire town just fucking attacks them for daring to not want to celebrate Christmas. Like, they basically... I feel like the logical conclusion of that movie, if they had kept refusing to celebrate Christmas... Someone would have just killed them. Like, they would have just been assassinated because people were so upset with them for not wanting to celebrate Christmas. So the 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 end of the movie, the the message of the movie is: if you're peer pressured into doing something by your community, you should probably just do it. <laughs> <laughs> so they end up not going on the vacation and they celebrate Christmas anyway, and then I think their daughter comes home early. Or so it has, like, the same message as The Last Jedi, which is don't question authority, just do whatever you're told. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. 
Oh, that's great. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Dan Aykroyd is in, Dan Aykroyd is in that movie, and he he like he plays this guy who he has like this company where he sells this um this thing called Frosty, which is like the snowman figurine which you put on your roof every Christmas. And for some reason, you have to buy a new one every Christmas. Like, why wouldn't you use the one you bought last year? But apparently it's a you thing. You, it's like this giant, like, seven-foot statue that you buy every Christmas. And you put it up on the roof. And then I guess when Christmas is over, you just fucking throw it on the tip or something. But you buy a new one every year. And then the cranks are tell him, like, oh, we're actually not going to be here this Christmas. We're going to go on vacation. And then he's like... How fucking dare you insult me this way? <laughs> Are you not gonna buy my stupid ass eight foot <laughs> snowman statue and put up on your roof using fucking ropes and pulleys? <laughs> like, how dare you? And then the entire community is like, yeah, how dare you? Yeah, yeah, how dare you? That's awesome. And then by the end, they're just like, oh, I guess we'll do it. I can just uh, see no, the okay. thing about Dan Aykroyd is I can see him reading the script going, this is great. This is awesome. This yeah. is so logical. <laughs> this is great. The thing about like Dan Aykroyd is he's a uniquely great, talented actor, comedian. Like really when he's mm. put in the right movie, he is like the perfect actor. Like if, he, if he's put in a good yeah. movie, but his judgment is awful. Like that's, he, mm. he needs to be surrounded by people who know better than him when it comes to writing movies, directing movies, starring, like which movies he should be starring in. Because when he's left alone, he will do this and like nothing but trouble, which is a movie where he plays yeah. a judge with a penis nose and, and like pigs rummaging through dirt because they're criminals. Like he's, <laughs> he's just like, he, if you just give him like 10 scripts and one of them is just like a joke you wrote in Comic Sans, he will pick the one in Comic Sans. Like, yeah. he just he, he's he's not to be trusted creatively really he needs a very tight leash yeah <laughs> uh, he's he is now. he is yeah he also believes in aliens he really believes in it yeah ufos and ghosts yeah his original script for ghostbusters was supposedly so weird and like so like he wrote mm. ghostbusters originally to like that's the document basically yeah to be like uh like like uh to to spread the message of ghosts being real and 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 yeah. like there's a great piece of of special edition stuff where all the uh, on on the blu-ray release of ghostbusters where all the actors are like interviewed and they talk about the movie and like bill murray's clearly like drunk and high and he's just like oh, it's great it's a good movie it's funny whatever whatever but then when they get to Dan Aykroyd, they're like, <laughs> and I watched it with my son a few years ago. And I told him, look, you have to take this stuff very seriously. You can't invite any negative energy into your life or invite the evil forces to take hold of you if you're, as you're watching this very informative document about spiritualism. And then after the movie, he said, Dad, are ghosts real? And I said, I couldn't lie to him because... Uh, you know, you have to be honest with your children because the media won't and the, you know, education won't. So you have to. So I sat him down and said, yes, ghosts are very real and they've infiltrated the government. And he's just like kept going. We're just like, whoa. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd is wild, man. But he, he's, he can be so good when he's in the right project. To bring it full circle, you might say that Ghostbusters is the modern variant of the Germanic folklore tales of uh, <laughs> monsters that eat your organs and stuff. Yes, it's a Brothers Grimm story <laughs> in the modern day. Yeah. It's there to warn kids yeah. uh, about the dangers of negative energy in your life or whatever. <laughs> yeah, but I'm telling you, like when Dan Aykroyd works with John Landis, it's great. It's always great. That's when you get the real yeah. Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Like in fucking Blues Brothers. Yeah. I loved him in Blues Brothers. He was great. He's really good. Um, and talented. Yeah, and he, like, even back then, he believed in aliens and stuff. Like, he was a weird man even back then, but he was great. Yeah. And he was really funny on the original Saturday Night Live, too. He did some really funny sketches. Yeah. 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 yeah so yeah. was, um, what's his name? John Belushi. Incredibly talented yeah. guy. Yeah. He died of a drug overdose. Yeah. He was, he was only like 40, like 42 or something when he died. It was really tragic. Yeah. Like, shortly after the first Blues Brothers film. Uh, he overdosed. I think. Yeah, I can't remember which movie he was supposed. To, like they were, they were. Oh, he was going to be in Ghostbusters. That's what it is. He was supposed to be like, um, uh -huh. um, uh, 
uh, Harold Ramis character, the nerdy scientist guy that was supposed to be. Um, oh. That would have been so great if John Belushi had had to play like a very nerdy, nerdy scientist guy. That would have <laughs> yeah. been so funny. Carrie Fisher was in Blues Brothers. I keep forgetting that. That's true. She was. Yeah. That movie is she so was the good. one trying to kill, uh, kill John. Yeah. Belushi. What's his name? Jake. Yeah, J- uh, Jake. Um, what are their last names? Blues. Yeah, isn't it just blues? Yeah, Jake and Elwood Blues. Yeah, Elwood. That's true. Yeah, ah, that's so beautiful. Can you imagine if they played jazz instead and their names were Jake and Elwood Jazz? <laughs> <laughs> Jake and Elwood Swing. Swing. Yeah. Uh, trap. <laughs> <laughs> we're just trap core artists. Yeah. Jake and Elwood Electro Pop. Yeah, <laughs> Neo Funk. <laughs> <laughs> that would rule, though. Yeah, that's pretty Yeah, funny. or House music. Yeah. It would just be Elwood House. Uh, those movies are so good. I think I'm going to watch Blues Brothers tonight now. <laughs> yeah, do so. It's a great movie. Yeah. Aretha Franklin was in it. Was yeah, good. yeah. Yeah, he was in so it. So that's, a, that's a, a shit island recommendation to watch Blues Brothers. Yeah, totally. If you haven't watched Blues Brothers, what are you even doing with your life? It's such a fun movie. Like, it's like a hangout. I think they even filmed it in, like, old Milwaukee or something in Wisconsin. So it has that middle America Mm. feel, and it's all very drab and depressing and industrial, and it's beautiful. In uh, in Swedish, we have a word uh, called allmän building, which means, like, uh, it essentially means zeitgeist, or it means, like... um, Ah. Uh, it means like common education or it's like folk education or something and it's basically like there are certain things which are part of Almen building ah. like certain things which everyone should know so like all man um, building almost right literally yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we have the a word for that but it's Danilse. it's like bildung in German mm. building it just means like you know like education or it means knowledge I guess yeah literally to be like Built like a house is built, but you're a human. Yeah, um, I guess I guess you, you can say stuff like knowing which political parties are in the parliament. That's Alman building. That's something everyone should. Yeah, Danielson in Danish or Bildung in German. Yeah, yeah. just like uh, stuff that that is generally believed that it you need to know it to be like a well-rounded member of society. Yeah, and I think the Blues Brothers is part of. That. Yeah, I would agree. Like, like so is <laughs> so are the original Star Wars movies, probably. Yeah. Um, like, if you don't, I mean, I guess pe- people might not have seen the original Star Wars movies, but you have to know what Star Wars is. Otherwise, like, how are you gonna function? Yeah, y- in society? you're gonna miss a lot of cultural references if you don't know what's in. Like, if you don't, if you never heard of Darth Wa- Darth Vader, or if you've never heard yeah. of, I don't know, Khan from Star Trek or Citizen Kane, like that type of stuff. Mm. I would agree, yeah. So that, that's our little uh, Nordic education to you yeah. guys. Almond building. <laughs> building in general. So watch Blues Brothers which, with your family this Christmas. Do it, yeah. It's actually, it would probably be a great movie to play at Christmas. Because it has great music yeah. in it. It's funny. It's kind of poignant. Like they're trying to get money for an orphanage, I think is the main plot storyline. Yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. of wholesome, but also really trying funny. To save an orphanage from yeah. Them. yeah. And like by the end, it's just like, <laughs> it just spirals out of control. Yeah, all of it. It's just it uh, goes to eleven, and then in the last fifteen minutes, yeah. it's great. It yeah yeah. The Blush Brothers movie held the record for the most car crashes on screen in a movie for like decades. It was yeah. only recently in like twenty eleven or something stupid. Yeah, like that. and I don't I don't think they the had all the permits time. either. There was some scandal about it that they just <laughs> did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah. They didn't even ask the police or anything. They just fucking filmed in Chicago yeah. on the street. <laughs> just like all these cars running. I do know, feel like I've was, heard you know. that the police showed up, the Milwaukee police or whatever, they're, wherever they were shooting, like just showed up and were like, what are you mm-hmm. doing? And like shooting a movie. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> can we be in it? Can we, can we also have a part in your movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can play the... Um, Fat mall cops. cop <laughs> number forty six. <laughs> <The, the, laughs> you can play the mall cops on the segways to get kicked in the nuts and make a goofy face. <laughs> <laughs> number forty three. Number forty. <laughs> uh-huh. 
Crazy. There is a mall scene in the Blues Brothers where they drive through a mall. That's true. Yeah, they originated. See, that's the thing. Like they originated that shot, and then they did it in a lot of movies after that, like Terminator Two and stuff, and and all the yeah, Chuck, Nor- yeah. Chuck Norris movies. Um, yeah. If you notice, like there's, that's a through line in the Chuck Norris movies too, is driving through malls and shooting terrorists in malls. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's. I feel like I feel like that's a callback in some way. Or, or just directors thinking that's a neat place to have a shootout or a drive-through or something is a mall. Yeah. I get. I feel like it's because like everyone knows what malls look like. Everyone has been in a mall. Yeah, everyone can. It's like, whoa! What if a car drove? Yeah, through? that'd be crazy. It's like you can. Relate yeah, everyone to can it. relate to how weird it would be if a giant monster truck just drove through it and killed a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you uh, you worded it a bit differently than I would have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Property damage. Woo. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on consumerism? Good, bad. I love me too. It. Thank you for listening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to consume some uh, stuff, we should we should call this episode the real Christmas episode about consumerism and only mention consumerism at the end. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) um, if if you want to spend some extra money this christmas uh you can you can become a patron over on patreon.com forward slash ash your scapegoat uh and give us some money we gave you the heart sell in the previous episode if you want to hear us really beg for you to support us listen to that episode (laughs) but really it would be like a giant help to us because like we're very poor we need help we need like money We're, right yeah. now. We we do need money, uh, just in yeah. general for rent and food and bills and stuff. It's just it's nice. It's nice to have money. I think I feel like in capitalist society, it's a good thing to have money. I'm not sure. I would have to read up on it, but I think so. Yeah, I think Marx might have written something about it, but yeah, I'll have to check it out. So thank you to our patrons, Joshua Cheesman. Dunk Junk Funk, Orsi Sabo Kitty, M Lim, Nian Chan Min, John H N, Michael Rook, L J. I I'm sorry about your name. L or Eli or Ale, depending on which one of those is a capital L and which one is. A, uh, I'm anyway. s- I'm sure you still Jedi pronounced Davian. it incorrectly. So. <laughs> Jedi Davian, Quagram, uh, Gecko Byte, and Emil Segerbeck. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you so much. And um, to future Peter, or I mean like current Peter, 19th December. Hey, bud. Um, hope the exam went okay. Um, keep your chin up. Uh, you're you're going to survive. <laughs> At this point, you will be fine, probably, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, uh, and I'm also working on a, a video about media. And if you want to hear more about that, then you can listen to the podcast that i did on left thinking with sansi uh on on the sansi youtube channel that's awesome Uh, i'm looking forward to seeing it are you send us an email to bluechew.com at shitisland.com so thank you everyone for watching for listening for sharing and rating and becoming a patron and doing all the good things yes thank you We'll probably not see you until January. No. Because it's Christmas. Yeah. If you hadn't noticed, uh, Christmas is happening. Did you know about that? I mean, yeah. I hope you have a wonderful Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever Kwanzaa is. I hope you enjoy it because it's cold. It's cold right now, at least in this part of the world. And uh, you should be huddled up next to people that don't hate you. And if you're one of those Mm -hmm. people... Like, no hate. But if you're one of those people that maybe likes to go on YouTube and watch stuff that upsets you, or maybe likes to go on Reddit and seek out people that disagree with you politically, maybe stop doing that for a few weeks and just, like, listen to good music, yeah. spend time with people you like, just give yourself a break, and recharge for the upcoming year, because January and February is always a nightmare. So give yourself a little That's true. self-care and, uh, you know... Uh, be try try to chill because this is the one time where it's like accessible in society or or like uh, blah, blah, admissible in society to chill. Yeah. So give yourself that as a present. Well, it was until the whole consumerism thing happened. Yeah, still though, you still get a couple of days where you're just with your family, 
Yeah. You get a few. You minutes. get a few minutes. Enjoy those minutes <laughs> and like yeah. take the opportunity and say that it's because it's the season that you're doing it. Just give yourself like a, yeah. a rest from looking up stuff that contradicts you, and just like be with, be at peace with yourself, and you know, be with people you enjoy being with, and you know, remember that sometimes it's also good to just be and be happy. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for listening. Thank you. And goodbye. goodbye. And Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. And then we ended on an outro of like uh, a, a very copyrighted Christmas song. Like, <laughs> Christmas <laughs> of the year. We just get sued yes. by fucking Disney or whoever owns all the Christmas music. We just play days. the audio of an entire Christmas special by Disney from the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> just like two hours extra audio.